welcome to today's webinar hosted by Black Dog Institute and Cresp. This webinar is in listen-only mode, so if you wish to ask the presenter a question, simply type it in the message box, which is located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to contribute at any time, although please note that we may not be able to answer all questions. If you have any technical issues, you can also type these in the chat box and someone will reply to you privately. Alternatively, please dial the 1-800 support number provided in the chat box. And if you experience any issues in hearing the sound coming from your computer, please feel free to listen to the webinar through your telephone, the details for which will appear in the chat box shortly. And if the webcam becomes distracting at any point, please feel free to click the turn off video button and you can turn it on at any time. I'd now like to hand over to Professor Navneet Kapoor to begin today's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. I'm uh, delighted to be here and um, this is very much a first for me. I've not done a webinar before, so I'm, I'm speaking to you from a uh, an office in uh, downtown um, a beautiful uh, Sydney and um, I'd like to welcome you all here. We've got people from uh, across Australia, uh, from New Zealand and even as far afield as Brazil. So uh, that's that's great. So okay, uh, I'll be speaking for hopefully 40-45 minutes and then uh, we, we'll have um, some time for questions at the end but uh, as, uh, as as you were told earlier, submit the questions at any time. All right, so there we go. So what I'm going to be talking about today is um, uh, suicide prevention, but really with a with a healthcare focus uh, in particular, and with um, very much a practical focus. So some of uh, uh, some of uh, what I'm going to present is research, but hopefully it's research uh, with a practical focus. Um, but you are going to get you are going to get uh, lots of um, statistics coming through on your um, computer. And um, one of the things that we have to remember is that behind um, behind the statistics that I'm going to present, um, there are individuals, uh, there are individual families, um, and every suicide, of course, is a kind of individual um, tragedy. And um, this is uh, this is the kind of message that's uh, this is one of the messages uh, that that. People have told us uh, left on our website back in Manchester um, about how it felt when they were uh, feeling desperate. Um, I'll give you a couple of minutes just to read that. Uh, people feeling there was nothing positive. People feeling they were alone. You won't notice if you're dying. They'll only notice if you're actually dead. So, you know, it captures the feeling of, of kind of um, desperation that, that people sometimes feel uh, when uh, when they're experiencing suicidal ideas. Um, but I've, I've promised you lots of statistics, so um, uh, I'll start how I mean to go on. So um, here are some suicide statistics. As you'll, as you'll notice from the corner of your slide, um, they're from 1951. Why have I put up this slide? Well, if you look at the slide, the um, dotted line on that slide is the number of men who were unemployed in Great Britain between the wars. And the black line there is the number of men who died by suicide. And as you can see, they mirror each other uh, more or less uh, exactly. And the message of that slide, the implication of that slide is kind of clear, um, that maybe the causes of suicide are primarily um, societal. They're to do with society, things that are going on. And this fellow, he, he certainly would have agreed with that. Um, he is Emil Durkheim, who, who published a, a monograph in 1897 on suicide, and it's still a bestseller. It's still a bestseller in in terms of kind of suicide prevention and research. Um, so the question is, if if you know it's all to do with suicide, if it's all to, if if it's all to do with society, if it's all to do with wider issues, um, what what am I kind of doing here, talking to you with a with a health service focus? What am I doing here, you know, in a sense, uh, picking um, a fight with uh, with Durkheim? So what what I'm going to be doing over the next uh, few minutes really is trying to convince you. Uh, that you know, health services do have a role, and what are, what are some of the practical implications of that, and what can we do? So I've come from Manchester. Uh, Manchester, it, there is uh, in the centre of the United Kingdom. It's in the northwest of England, and um, you can tell that those are um, tourist office uh, photos because the sun uh, the sun is shining. Um, and uh, in the bottom of your screen, then that's Old Trafford. But we're we're not a city that's all about football. Um, it's uh, there's a kind of vibrant, uh, it's a vibrant kind of post-industrial city now, Manchester, um, and you, you should all come and visit. 
Okay, let's let's give you a bit of context now. I want to talk about um, what's happening with um, suicide figures in the United Kingdom and uh, in the UK, as in um, Australia, uh, the, the long term trends are really down, um, so which is which is fantastic news. Um, in the UK, like Australia, men are much more likely to die by suicide than um, women. And why is that? Well, it's probably to do with uh, the fact that men pick more dangerous methods when they uh, when they hurt themselves, um, and it may also be due to do with um, uh, help seeking. So when men become physically or psychologically distressed, uh, they, uh, they they're much less likely to seek help. So it might be help seeking. It might be used uh, due to the methods that men choose. Um, the other thing that's similar in the UK, in the UK uh, to Australia is, is the main method of suicide. Uh, apologies, it's a bit of a kind of gruesome topic, topic talking about methods of suicide, but we are talking about suicide prevention, so it's an important aspect of that. So the commonest method in the UK, as in Australia, is hanging. Um, but there are some things that are different. So in the UK, um, the recession, the economic recession in the UK, has been much deeper than it has been um, in uh, in Australia, and really that's been uh, we think that's been translated into, and I'll just highlight on your screens now. Whoops. Just highlight on your screens now. Um, uh, that's been translated into an increase in the male uh, male suicide rate, and we think that's due to the economic recession. Um, the other thing that's different is we've seen a particular increase in um, uh, suicide by um, uh, middle-aged men. So, uh, but that we've seen a big increase there. So that again is different. So I wanted to start by some um, general um, uh, general uh, strategies for preventing suicide, which will be really familiar to you. Um, but um, I felt that you know we, we we needed to discuss them. So the first is probably the strategy for which there's the most evidence worldwide is preventing access to lethal methods of suicide. And so we're talking here about things like barriers on bridges, um, restricting the availability of toxic medications, um, uh, gun control, that, that kind of thing. And the, the rationale behind it is that um, suicidal behavior is sometimes um, an impulsive act. And if you um, prevent ready access to a, to a dangerous method of suicide, um, the, the, if you like, the suicidal thoughts will um, subside, and you'll have prevented a death. And I think I think that's absolutely right. So here's uh, one example um, from the UK. Um, the black line on your screens here is what happened to um, deaths in males following the introduction of catalytic converters on cars in the late 1980s. So of course that's not a, that's not a suicide prevention measure. That's a that's a um, uh, kind of ecological measure and environmental measure that, that had, you know, fortunately beneficial consequences. And so um, the rate of suicide deaths by um, car exhaust poisoning uh, went down markedly. That's the black line. What you have to watch, of course, uh, when you're talking about access and means to suicide is method substitution. So the white line there is what happened to deaths in young males um, by hanging. Okay, so um, method substitution isn't inevitable. Um, we think that it might happen in perhaps a third of cases. No one really, uh, no one really knows. But um, method substitution is something you have to watch. But but by and large, limiting access to lethal means of suicide is an incredibly effective suicide prevention measure. Another really important um, uh, suicide prevention measure is, is to do with how um, suicide and suicidal behavior are reported in the media, and uh, many of you will be very familiar with this. But um, I just wanted to focus on, on some recent data from the UK. Um, there was it, this, this is a kind of typical um, headline from a local paper uh, reporting on uh, what was a, a possible cluster in Wales, in, in South Wales. Um, and colleagues, um, colleagues um, in Swansea and uh, Wales and uh, other academic centres actually examined this cluster in detail. They found something I think really interesting. Um, they found that actually there was statistical evidence of a cluster of suicides, but the cluster start like this, was smaller. So these graphs show the possible um, cluster. The, the cluster was smaller and later 
and was actually reported in the media. And actually, the timing of the cluster began after the media reporting. So the media were reporting on a cluster, um, and the actual cluster, the statistical evidence for the cluster, was actually more or less after that. So this, I think, is a really important study that, that uh, provides some evidence that the media are actually uh, responsible in some way for propaga propagating the cluster. And, and there's media guidelines out there for how the media should responsibly report suicide. Uh, there's, there's guidelines across the world in the US, in the UK, and Australia. And it's about uh, not referring to um, access to means in detail, not, not giving real details of method, not trying to glamorize or, or give undue prominence to suicide stories. So um, just, just advance these slides. Yeah. So one of the things I'm asked um, quite often is what causes suicide. And, and this slide is a, a slide adapted from uh, my friend and colleague uh, David Gunnell's work um, uh, on causes of suicidal behavior. And there's a wide variety of things that cause suicide, things that you're born with, things that may happen to you, psychological factors. But the, really, the two I want to focus on uh, for the rest of the talk are um, the role of mental illness. So we think that psychiatric disorder um, if you believe some of the early research is, is present in 9 out of 10 people who might die by suicide. Um, but also previous suicidal behaviour. So um, uh, the best predictor of future behaviour is, is past behaviour, so uh, the role of previous suicidal behaviour. So they're really important um, risk factors. So um, what I want to do is just focus on um, uh, uh, two groups really, people under the care of mental health services and people with a history of suicidal behavior and and for each of those I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background context but then really try and focus on what works okay so the first group is people under the care of mental health services and um, quite a lot of what we know about that group uh, in the UK comes from this project which I work on it's the National Confidential Inquiry um, and um, I'm going to tell you about some of the suicide findings today so the National um, Confidential Inquiry is essentially a, a, a massive kind of case series. We've been running since um, around 1996, and um, you know that that's a that's an awfully big uh, toll of suicide on, on that side. So uh, over a hundred thousand um, general population suicide deaths we have detail of on 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 that database. And the first really important finding um, from the inquiry is. Um, being able to establish which individuals had contact with mental health services. So I'm really here, I'm talking about specialist mental health services rather than primary care. Um, how many people had contact in 12 months before death? And the answer is around a quarter. So around a quarter of people had contact with mental health services in the, in the 12 months before death. And really, these are the group that the National Confidential Inquiry collect detailed data on. So, so quite a lot of the, uh, the next few minutes will be about this clinical uh, this, this group who are in clinical contact. And there's some things uh, uh, in that group that you'd expect. So high levels of social isolation, previous self-harm and, and substance misuse. You'd expect that given what we know about risk factors for suicide. Um, but one of the things that surprised us early on was the fact that uh, many people died in close proximity to inpatient care. So um, generally, we'll admit people to um, psychiatric inpatient care if we want to mitigate their, their risk, if we want to um, reduce their risk. But we were finding that up to a third of this clinical sample were dying either whilst they were inpatients or shortly afterwards. So that, that to us was a surprise when we first started. This slide looks at the timing. So one of the things obviously here that it, when, when, um, I, I talked initially about general suicide prevention uh, measures, which are really powerful. This is now suicide prevention in that in that group of people who are in contact with services. So it's only a quarter of people. So in terms of, if you like, population impact on suicide, uh, it, it's perhaps, um, you know, you might perhaps have less of an impact. But what we're ta talking about here really is preventing suicide in services and improving safety. So it's about improving safety of your services, not just preventing suicide. But if we're looking about, if we're looking about preventive opportunities, this slide looks at the timing. It looks at when people last saw services. Um, prior to dying, um, and it's quite striking. So if you if you look on your on your um, at the slide there, about half of people in this clinical um, sample 
half of people had had contact in the week before death. So if we're looking, um, if we're looking at you know uh, an opportunity for pre prevention, there's an opportunity right there. You've got you know 50% of people in contact um, uh, in the seven days uh, prior to death. So that's a little bit of background on the mental health sample. Just keeping an eye on the time to make sure we've got plenty of time for discussion at the end. Let's focus now a little bit on what might work. What, 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 what might work um, to improve safety in mental health uh, settings? So the first thing I wanted to focus on is psychiatric inpatient care. So um, if you like, that's uh, in many senses the most intensive, intensive level of intervention uh, we have available uh, in mental health. We admit someone to uh, an inpatient bed. And what's happened in the UK over the last 30 or 40 years, in common with most of the Western world actually, is that our number of psychiatric beds has shrunk. And what that means is that the people who do get admitted um, are at a kind of higher threshold, so they're more unwell, they've got greater mental health needs, um, it's uh, you know it's it's a more morbid if you like in in you know medicalizing it a little bit inpatient population, but on the other hand, um, so if you've got uh, if you've got more unwell inpatient population, you might expect that to actually put the suicide rates up. But on the other hand, um, what you've had is falling general population rates and a real focus on safety, particularly around the environment, so preventing, um, preve uh, um, removing ligature points from inpatient units and around absconding, so, so patients or, or service users leaving uh, inpatient facilities without staff permission. So on the one hand, you've got a kind of smaller inpatient bed with more unwell people. But on the other hand, you've got this safety focus and falling general population rates. So the question is, which way have rates of inpatient suicide in, in England gone? And this slide gives you the answer. So there's been a very robust 30% uh, reduction in the rate of inpatient suicide. And actually, uh, that, that slides up until 2008 because it's from an academic paper. But we know uh, that the rate has continued to fall. And that's not due to falls in the general population because um, that's a much bigger fall uh, than the rate you, the fall you see in the general population. It's not due to changes in, in case mix. Um, but we think it may be to do with um, uh, improving safety measures because you see particular falls in inpatient hanging and um, suicide deaths after people have left the ward. So we think it might have something to do with the safety measures. Um, but here's the other thing it might have something to do with. The black line here is the rate of suicide in the immediate post-discharge period. So the rate in inpatients has gone down, the rate in uh, the post-discharge period has gone up. Now that increase, that increase in the post-discharge period isn't um, big enough to account for the decrease. So it's not just uh, the, you know, the, the risk is being transferred to the post-discharge period. And it's not just to do with shrinking lengths of stay because we've, we've kind of looked at that. But it does illustrate the, the point that you can improve safety in one bit of your system, so inpatients, but you have to keep your eye on other bits of the system. Because you can shift the, the problem in time, so that, that shift in problem in time, but this, this slide shows how you can shift it in setting. So one of, the, um, one of the service initiatives that's come up in the UK as an alternative to inpatient care is so-called kind of hospital at home, so we call them crisis resolution home treatment teams. The blue line there shows how inpatient suicide has fallen. The red line there shows how suicide under the care of crisis resolution home treatment has increased. Now, you'd expect that increase, that red line increase in a way, because lots and lots more people are being treated under CRHTs, are being treated at home. But actually, when we look at the rate, so when we take into account the more people are being treated under CRHTs, when we take into account the rate, the rate's actually higher now in CRHTs than it is under inpatients, which might mean, um, and certainly colleagues who work in those settings um, tell us this, that people working in those home treatment teams are actually now seeing the highest risk patients. So, um, so th there's an illustration. You're focusing on safety in inpatient settings, but keep your eye on other bits of your system. Let's think now about um, wider policies. Um, so that's focusing on a specific setting. Let's think now more about um, the role of uh, wider policies in mental health. So back in 2001, uh, excuse you, me, I'm going to just take a sip of water. So back in 2001, we made uh, a number of recommendations for mental health services to improve safety. And, and you can see from your screens there, it's a it's a wide variety of different things. So there's things there about environmental safety, so removal of ligature points, 
uh, things in there about following people up. So uh, following people up within seven days of inpatient discharge, crisis teams, um, information sharing, multidisciplinary uh, review, um, and um, training. So, so a wide variety of different things that we uh, recommended to the service back in 2001. And we've had two questions with those, with those recommendations. The first is a really important one. Did the mental health services actually take any notice of our recommendations? Um, or did they just sit, sit on the shelf? You know, um, the thing with policy documents, strategy documents, sometimes even with the best intentions, they sit on they sit on the um, they sit on the, um, they sit on the uh, on shelf. So did did they get implemented? And the more important question is, did they make a difference in terms of outcomes? So let me answer the first question first of all. Did they did they implement them? Yes, um, certainly when we, we looked at the pattern of implementation, when we asked mental health services, more and more of those nine recommendations got implemented over time. Did they make a difference? That's, of course, the more important question. Well, yeah, we, we, we think they did. So this slide looks at the suicide rate in the services, so about, out of about 80 services in England and Wales. Um, the services that implemented most of the recommendations, so seven to nine recommendations, it's blue in the slide there, versus services that had implemented fewer of the recommendations. So the services that implemented more of those changes, made more of those service changes, safety, safety changes, had lower suicide rates. And that's really reassuring, um, but it's really quite a weak uh, type of analysis. It's a cross-sectional analysis. There might be all kinds of other things um, that, that, that are accounting for that. So the other thing we did was for each of those nine recommendations, we lined up, uh, we lined up the date of implementation and we looked at suicide rates um, before and after each of those nine uh, recommendations had been implemented. And what we found was that for eight of the nine recommendations, there were significant falls in the suicide rate, and those falls were were um, particularly impressive for three, uh, for three um, of the recommendations, and they were the implementation of 24-hour crisis uh, care for people. So, after services implemented a system of 24-hour crisis care, um, suicide rates dropped. Um, having implementing a dual diagnosis policy, so that's a policy for people with uh, drug and alcohol problems as well as major mental illness and having a system of multidisciplinary review after uh, a suicide death or an adverse incident. So that's something, that's a marker, if you like, for a learning culture. So those three recommendations were associated with big falls, big falls in suicide rate. And it wasn't a trivial uh, effect. That's, a, that's about 200 to 300 um, fewer deaths per year. Um, and we didn't see are the same falls in non-implementing services. So if you like, the services that hadn't made those changes, we didn't see those falls. So there's something there really about the, um, uh, there's something in there really about um, uh, you know, the, the potential power of um, uh, policies and, and making service level changes. But we got very interested in the wider context. So there are about individual changes you might make in a service, but we're, we're also really interested in um, how um, the wider um, uh, features of our mental health service. And um, here are, there are a couple of reports in the UK. There's the Francis report and the Berwick report that really focused on, on patient safety and looked at kind of organisational failings of quite critical reports. And I know. Uh, you know, in, here in Australia and, and elsewhere, you've had kind of critical reports as well that have criticised really the way services have been configured or organised. And, and we've done a study on this uh, last year. Um, and it was a very simple study. It was just looking at how different aspects of organisational functioning might be related to suicide rate. And I'll just, um, yeah, I'll just... So a lot of things weren't related to suicide rate. So things like patient satisfaction or staff satisfaction. But this factor was... So this, this is... Um, how quickly staff turn over, so how quickly staff um, leave an organisation, non-medical staff turnovers, so primarily, primarily nurses and allied mental health professionals. And what we found was in the services where staff turned over more rapidly, they had higher suicide rates. 
Now that's quite a weak correlation you can see on your slide, but it's a significant one, a statistically significant one. And of course it might not be causal. So, so maybe it's a marker, non-medical staff turnover might be a marker of a failing organisation. So if you've got a, a, a mental health service, it's not a very nice place to work, staff turnover, and actually because it's not a very nice place to work and, and perhaps isn't functioning with suicide rates. So it might be a marker, but it could also plausibly, plausibly, we're not saying this is, is the case, but it could be causal in that services which have a high turnover of staff are, are, are able to provide less kind of continuity of care, know their patients and service users less well. So this is something where we're exploring in more um, detail in um, our future work. So just summarising now um, some of the stuff on mental health care, it's clear that you know if you focus on a particular setting, inpatient care or, um, is, is our example, you can make a difference to safety, you can make a difference to suicide, but you, you need to make sure that the problem doesn't kind of pop up elsewhere, so you're keeping your eyes on all parts of the system. Um, and um, the other approach that, that you know, certainly seems to be effective from, from um, our work is, is, this, is this role of policies or system-wide changes um, that may be effective in preventing suicide. But you do need to keep an eye again on, you need to, do need to pay attention to the kind of organisational context. Because the organisational context, for example, you know, uh, services with high staff turnover or high levels of um, patient incident reporting, that, that you, you do need to keep your eye on that. But that service-wide change is a good way to um, good way potentially to uh, uh, to prevent suicide. Let's talk now about um, people with a history of suicidal behaviour. So um, I, don't, I don't need to spend too long about it, uh, too long on terminology because uh, 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 I, uh, most of the people listening in use the same terminology as us, so self-harm uh, rather than non-suicidal um, self-injury. Uh, we, we, you know, th th there's a very valid debate about what terminology and, and um, uh, nomenclature we should use uh, for uh, to classify suicidal behavior we've we've argued um, for a, for a, if you like a catch-all self-harm approach and you can read more about it in that paper published in the British of psychiatry uh, a couple of years ago but I don't, don't really want to spend too long talking about that but really what I'm talking about here is um, self-poisoning or self-injury and most of what I'm going to be talking about is self-poisoning or self-injury presenting to services. So we have to acknowledge a lot of self-harm, especially in young people, doesn't come to the attention of services. So self-harm, deliberate self-harm, um, is a very common problem uh, in many Western settings. It's certainly common back in the UK. Um, why am I talking about it in an lecture on suicide prevention? Well, it's very strongly linked to suicide. So about half of people who die by suicide have a history of self-harm. And in the year after someone might present to uh, my emergency department with self-harm, they're at between 30 to 50 times a greater risk of suicide in the following year. So it really is an important risk factor of suicide. And you can express that in even starker terms. So this is a study led by uh, colleagues Helen Bergen and Keith Wharton in Oxford that we also contributed to. And it looks at um, deaths from external causes. So when, when we talk about external causes, things like accidents, suicide deaths, misadventure deaths. And the full height of the line, so including the grade segment there, is the life expectancy in men generally. So that's about 80 years. And the black line there is the life expectancy in men who have self-harmed. So the message is clear. It's about half the life expectancy, about 30 to 40 years of life loss. So, you know, um, sometimes I'll uh, talk to colleagues and they'll say, oh, well, self-harm is not a serious behaviour, is it? It's, it's attention seeking. Certainly self-harm that comes to the attention of services is a really serious behaviour and, and, you know, may be associated with a halving of uh, life expectancy. So we've got a common problem. We've got a problem that's associated with a high risk of death. How do, how do we do in terms of managing it? This is a study that we did uh, back in 2013, and we just looked at how 32 hospitals in the UK managed um, self-harm over a three-month period. And, and this is, um, this is this slide shows the proportion of people who were assessed by a specialist, had a psychosocial assessment. And the variability is what's uh, most apparent on that slide. So in some places, it was about 20% of people getting an assessment. In other places, over 80%. So we've got a problem in self-harm that's common. It's um, associated with a high risk of death and 
the, ver the, the management is all over the place. And that's um, that's echoed in um, that's echoed in um, you know the accounts we get from our patients and, and service users. This is these are some accounts from a systematic review uh, that uh, Britannia Taylor led in Oxford. I'll just give you a couple of seconds to read that. And, and and you know, there's there's no place for that kind of attitude in the in the management of uh, people uh, people who are suicidal and need our help. So it's it's not well managed uh, on the whole, certainly in the UK. But that, I know that experience is echoed in in Western countries as well. What works? Well, how can we do better? Well, um, I spent two years of my life uh, chairing uh, the NICE, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence clinical guidelines on, on self-harm. And I think clinical guidelines are, are you know, potentially really helpful, can help those of us working in services um, uh, identify the best evidence, best practice. What NICE, I think, have done this time is quite smart. So uh, those of you who are familiar with the guidance will know it's uh, 428 pages of um, uh, high quality reading. Uh, but what NICE have done is that they've done something quite smart, which is all of their guidelines, not just the self-harm guidelines, they're distilled into quality standards. So these are um, markers of um, high quality care. So it's a, it's a bit of a shame that in 2013 we were having to have that number one as a marker of high quality care. Uh, people being treated with the same compassion, respect and dignity as everyone else. But uh, there you go. They, these, are, these are markers of high quality care. Some of the other ones to do with assessment, physical environment, that services can measure. And people who commission services, people who pay for services, um, can also uh, look at in order to decide which elements of the service they fund or which elements of the service they they uh, they develop. So I think things like this uh, really might help with the implementation of, of guidance. You've got quality standards of which against which um, uh, services can be measured. Um, but um, I'm pleased to say that in the UK it's been taken a step further. So you've not just got the eight quality standards; you've actually got self harm as a key outcome measure, as a key health outcome measure um, and it's and there's two elements to that one is uh, the the overall level of self-harm presenting to emergency departments but also uh, uh, the proportion of people getting an assessment okay so that's um, guidance so hopefully the guidance is going to make a difference the 2012 guidance we are evaluating it uh, we will be able to say how how what how much of a difference it's made the other thing I think that, that can make a difference following self-harm is aftercare and this is just a metro, this is a, quite an old uh, forest plot now. Uh, this review is being updated. Keith Horton and colleagues uh, in Oxford are updating the systematic review. But, but this is, these, are, these are the findings from the NICE, uh, when, we, when we looked at it from the NICE guideline, that the psychological intervention is the only thing you really need to look at is the black diamond there. Psychological intervention, some kind of you know, CBT or interpersonal therapy or, or, um, or problem solving associated with a 25% reduction in the risk of repeat self-harm. So some evidence there that they uh, they work. The problem, of course, is that um, when you do a randomized trial, you don't get, uh, if you like, always a typical clinical population into your randomized trial because people refuse or you can't get a hold of them. Um, and the other problem with randomized trials is they tend to be small. So if you look at the error pl error bars there on your on your slide, they're wide, which means that, they, um, that, that, that the studies are quite small. So the other thing we could do is we could um, use routine data collection. So this is something we're really quite keen on because then you can get everyone in. Obviously, it's not a randomized study. So you know you can't demonstrate cause and effect. But, but using the data we collect anyway might be um, quite, uh, quite powerful. So let's think about you know, a study we did which um, looked at psychosocial assessments. A slide there is supposed to represent a psychosocial assessment. So I'm talking about a holistic assessment of, um, of needs, uh, clinical factors, social factors, after someone presents with self-harm. And what we did in this big study of using the multi-center study of self-harm database in England, was it, this is over 35,000 individuals. We compared people who'd got an assessment um, with people who didn't, and then we followed them up to see who repeated and who didn't. And, and obviously, that's not randomized. So different people get assessments and don't. So statistically, we adjusted for those. So we've adjusted for baseline characteristics. And we found that in two of the centers, centers B and C there, um, that the risk of repetition was reduced by 40%. So 40% reduction in the risk of repetition 
just by doing an assessment. In Centre, we didn't see that effect. In Centre, we probably didn't see that effect because um, that was the centre where they assessed the fewest people. Um, and if you're assessing the fewest people, they're, they're probably the highest risk people. So that, that centre A is probably a kind of high risk selection effect. But in the other centres, a 40% reduction just by um, assessing people. And the question is, how, how does that work? Well, it could be, it could be just the assessment itself. So the therapeutic effect of the assessment itself. So here's an account we had from a service user in a different study. Well, the main thing was the psychiatrist looked like they actually cared, and that was a really positive thing. Um, but the other thing that assessment allows you to do is plug people into aftercare. So um, the, 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 the other person here uh, was getting regular phone calls, uh, keeping people informed. They knew what was coming. So there's something about therapeutic engagement when you see someone, but there's also something about plugging someone in access into aftercare. Okay, but I, but I also wanted to talk about risk assessment. So I'm not Psychosocial assessments are holistic assessment of, you know, uh, psychiatric uh, symptoms, uh, social uh, needs, circumstances. Risk assessments much narrower. So, you know, often in mental health we're obsessed by risk assessment, and it's to do with how, um, how, how, at what risk, uh, how can we predict who's at risk of suicide or, or homicide or some other other risk. And we, we you know, it, it, it's very much in mental health tied up in the notion of um, of prediction. So I just wanted to quickly discuss risk assessment with you. So these are data now from the National Confidential Inquiry. So remember, these are people, all of whom, they're in mental health service contact, but all of whom have died. And we asked the clinicians, when you last saw them, what did you think their risk was? And we found something quite surprising in that 90% of cases, so 86% of cases there on your slide, the clinician said, well, the immediate risk was low or none. So remember, these people have all died. They've all died, and the clinicians are saying the risk is low or none. So it could be a defensive um, rep uh, approach to uh, reporting. So you know, you've you've had a form from the confidential inquiry asking you what you thought the risk was. The person has died. You know, understandably, I as a clinician would understand this. You might you might think, well, actually, you know what? I I, I didn't think the risk was that high when I last saw them. The other thing it could be to do with is that risk changes. However, when we look at when people were last seen. People were last seen within seven days of death in about half the cases. So risk might have changed, but um, you know most of them were seen within a week of death. So you have to bear that bear that in mind. But here's the other thing: it can be. Remember, 90% of people are being estimated as risk low or none. But then we have, a, if we have a look at their behavioural features, if we have a look at who these people were, 70% had a history of self harm, a fifth had a history of violence. Almost half had a history of alcohol misuse, and about a third had a history of drug misuse. So, if you like, that, 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 that's that's not low risk by anyone's uh, any stretch of the imagination. Um, but what we might have, those of us working in mental health services, is a resetting of our risk barometer. If you like, we're seeing so many people who are at high risk. Our risk uh, barometer resets. So that's a problem with risk assessment. You might say, well, now that's that's all rubbish because um, what we're looking at there is um, we're just looking at you know, asking people after the event. What we really need is a prospective study. But it doesn't work out much better when you're looking at prospective studies. Okay? So this is a study looking at people who are self-harmed and looking at how people were rated in terms of risk and then following them up in terms of people repeating. So in some senses, you could say, well, you know, it's looking OK. Um, uh, people in the high risk group, about 26% of people repeat. People in the low risk group, only about 9.6%, 10%. But the problem is, if you use that as a um, if you use that as a way of rationing resources. So if you were to restrict yourself to the high risk group and you prevented all repeat episodes, how many repeat episodes are you going to prevent? You're going to prevent 95. But you'll have missed you'll have missed the repeat episodes in the low and moderate risk groups. So this is an example, if you like, of the population paradox. The low and moderate risk groups are much bigger. And so you miss the high risk groups. But you could say, oh well, you know, so you miss uh, you miss those other. But you could say, well, look, what we need here is the appliance of science. That's just what um, people thought. What we really need are risk tools. That will tell us who's at risk and who isn't. Here's a sad person's scale. Here's, here's one of those risk tools. We actually reviewed that as part of the guideline. And again, 
they, they're just no good in terms of prediction. So if we're, if we're looking at the prediction of suicide following self-harm, the positive predictive value is 5%. That means you're wrong. That means you're wrong 95% of the time. And you miss, more importantly, you miss large numbers of suicide deaths in the low risk group. So again, an example of that population um, par paradigm. So we said in our guidelines, don't use them. Don't use them to predict. Don't use them to determine your management. Uh, but you could use them to help add structure or add detail. So we said don't use them in the guidelines. What's happening? Well, here's a study that we did led by Leah Quinlavan uh, in my unit. And actually, uh, most places are using them. So 30 out of the 32 sites were using a risk assessment scale. Uh, and what was even more striking is that in 22 places, uh, they, it was a measure they'd made up themselves, so it wasn't even a validated measure. So they're, they're in widespread use, and we need to do a bit more work about um, uh, you know, what we do about that. So just in summary then, um, general population strategies for suicide prevention are really important. They certainly seem to work restricting access to means, um, media, uh, uh, media guidelines uh, are important. I haven't talked about the treatment of depression today. I haven't talked about um, the role of primary care, but in the discussion we can pick, pick that up if we need to. They certainly seem to work. In a clinical setting, you can focus on particular bits of the system, but keep your eyes on other bits. Uh, policies and system-wide changes actually can be really effective. I think we need to do more work in that area. Um, from the point of view of non-fatal uh, suicidal behaviour, self-harm, I, I think clinical guidelines are, uh, are a way to go. What we need to do there is make sure they're implemented and monitor their effectiveness. Um, but also doing really simple things like just you know um, a, a proper assessment um, might have tangible benefits, and that's a really important message I think clinically because sometimes you know we find it very very difficult. It, you know it may be a hard to access clinical group. Um, you know um, sometimes very challenging problems. And if you know as a clinician I'm thinking, well actually just doing the assessment might might have some benefit uh, that could, that can help. Um, but also risk assessment is very prevalent. Um, it's a, it's a hot issue. Um, and our approaches to it need careful thought. Um, that's great. Okay, I think we're done there, so um, we can um, go on questions. So is that that the question there? Okay, sorry. Right, so we'll start on questions then. So, whoops. Okay. So how have you highlighted them? Sorry, I'm just, we're just. Uh, all right, great. All right, fine. So you're going to give me the questions. That's that's really helpful. Thank you. Hi, Sue. Yeah. Yep. That's uh, that's a really good point from Sue, and um, the answer is yes, we have. So if I was um, if I was talking like this um, if I was talking like this uh, so the question uh, the question for those of you who didn't hear it was um, ha the, the, in 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 Australia there's been a, a shift to more violent means of suicide in women has there been a similar um, has there been a similar shift in the UK and there absolutely has so if I was talking to you um, you know uh, a few years ago uh, the common method in women will have been self poisoning but that's shifted. Uh, shifted unfortunately to hanging now, so more more violent methods in women and and men. Uh, why is that? It's a, a very tricky one. Hanging hanging is a you know very very difficult um, uh, method to manage outside of institutional settings. But we think you know part part of the reason may be due to its cognitive availability. So uh, thinking about how suicide might be portrayed or reported more widely is really important. But but that's a shift we've seen. In the UK as well, and and it might also be linked to greater alcohol use. I have another question here from Helen Christensen, and she's asked quite bluntly: How preventable is suicide if we employ all the interventions that you mentioned? I, I, I think that's a that's an excellent question. Um, you know, uh, there are there are there are some proponents, I think, of a kind of zero tolerance um, approach to suicide, and I think if that's about making um, if that's about making our Societies and our services as safe as possible. Then I'm then I'm fully signed up to that. Um, I think what we can't have though is um, a kind of blame culture either in services or um, 
or in 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 wider society so i think suicide is 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 definitely preventable it's um uh, something uh, we should aspire to making our services as safe as possible um i am not one of these people that would um give you a a, a definite kind of preventable fraction um is it feasible um to reduce the number of suicides to zero i'd i'd like to think it was in an ideal world but many things you know we'd like to think of in an ideal world so um you know i think targets um are perhaps i'm i'm, I'm less comfortable with targets so targets everywhere sometimes as long as they're aspirational targets i think they can really be helpful um but you know when 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 sometimes you know because suicide is so broad ranging if if you have targets and you hold yourself to targets it can be it can be a it can be a bit of a problem so yes suicide's preventable um, but i'm not going to put a figure on it today thanks nav so the next question we have is referring to your uh, talking about system change and looking at how far does that change go for example do we need to look to things like homelessness as a way of managing I think, I, I, suicide I think, prevention you know for me um uh, i focused on little bits of the picture here today and and you know if um, I think there's some real virtues in a kind of systems approach. So we have we have to think of um, anything that we can do um, that's likely to have an impact. And certainly things like uh, social isolation and homelessness are are, are a big big factor in in, in um, suicide deaths. Things like um, drug and alcohol are are a big um, a big uh, a big factor. And and you know one of the other massive things of you know you, you, in a talk like this you can't focus on everything. One of the other massive things I've not focused on here is the role of social policy and deprivation. So you know uh, when there are challenging economic times, when levels of employment unemployment uh, increase, how, how do you manage that? Well, on the one hand, there's a school of thought to say that if you if you increase welfare spending, uh, you mitigate effects of unemployment on on health and mental health and, and perhaps even suicide on the other hand uh, you know you might have a, a view that well you know the societal things are out of our control as as health service practitioners thanks now can i just I'll also just say that there is some extra time here for questions so please feel free to send them through if you have any the next question we have is from jacinta at azrap uh, hers is a comment slash question. She said that she is very frequently asked how to apply a collaborative mode of therapeutic assessment in A and E departments when they're so hurried and stressed. Yeah, Do you have I mean, any thoughts real, about that? It's a real challenge because uh, you know I, I work with uh, emergency department colleagues and I know the pressures they're under and they need to, you know, it's a, it's a fast, rapid, high intensity clinical environment. Um, I, mean, I suppose my response would be, you know, it. Mental health is is a core part of their business. I think, you know, uh, most emergency department practitioners recognise that you know for people with mental health needs, it isn't simply a question of referring people uh, on. There is a core part of the ED business that that is dealing with with mental health problems, and and then plugging them in appropriately. Of course, we're not expecting ED departments to provide, you know, therapeutic interventions. Um, but you know, it, it it's about I think uh, mental health and emergency departments working collaboratively. Certainly in the UK, and I know here, uh, what's been helpful from that point of view is a is a liaison psychiatry model. So having you know a mental health presence in the acute hospital in the emergency department and and that really i think helps collaborative working and, and mutual understanding so i think that's that's that can be really helpful thanks nev uh, nav we have a question from petra and she's asked with the information that you've given us today is there anything specific for youth yeah. youth or um, young I people i think um, a lot of what i've talked about today are is, is kind of universal so it's across um the age range um uh, paradoxically, some of the, if you like, some of the stuff on mental health services that I've talked about might be less relevant, uh, might be less relevant to to younger people because fewer of them are in contact. So if the if the, if the overall proportion is a quarter, it's something like 10 to 15 percent for some of the younger age groups. On the other hand, uh, self harm is a huge problem. Um, non fatal suicidal behaviours are a huge problem in in younger people, and you know some of the some of the intervention strategies may be may be more um, specific. So you know people have done work on systems and family based therapies, and also of course um, there's lots of work going on worldwide on a more 
tech technologically innovative um, solutions to reach that younger group. So I think you know one of the big big issues for, for young people is um, is, is self harm. I think the other the other kind of policy challenges for, for young people certainly in the UK is a uh, is the role of alcohol. So how how we stop young people maybe uh, using alcohol and of course the media stuff that the, the, the possibility of uh, Contagion or, or, or um, propagation of suicide again is a big issue in in, in self harming young people and and there's all sorts of things out there um, school programs etc that that may help with that. Which actually does lead into our next question from Helen Christensen talking about gatekeeper programs in the community and what about the role of yeah, those? Yeah, I mean, I think you know that again they're potentially very valuable and um, you know it's it's back to one of the kind of classic studies in in suicide prevention uh, carried out on a Swedish island. So those, many of you will be familiar with it. It's the Gotland study where they where they trained. It was a small Swedish island. They trained all of the island's thirty general practitioners in. Uh, depression uh, assessment and, and and management and also um, you know thinking about how that worked and general practitioners are often gatekeepers that seem to have an effect there's other kind of gatekeeper approaches um, that that, um, that that may be um, may be effective our own research in primary care you know in the UK something like 60 over 60 percent of people have had contact with their general practitioners in the 12 months before death um, there are signals that, that, that they're you know people attend a lot they're at greater risk um, you know there are signals that, that general practitioners might pick up it's not simply a question of you know um, general practitioners picking up the signals screening better because I think screening is a bad idea um, you know, it's partly to do with mental health services as well. So it's partly their access to mental health services. But if you think about it, you know, 60% of people in contact with primary uh, primary care services, 25% in contact with mental health services. I think, you know, there, there definitely is a role for um, gatekeeper. Um, primary care gatekeeping mm. training. We're jumping back a little bit to a previous discussion here, but Michael Dudley has asked um, what your opinion is about including including uh, alcohol and other other things into suicide policy. I, th I think it's it's kind of it's kind of vital, you know. If if we're going to have um, suicide prevention policies, they've got to be they've got to be wide ranging. And and you know, there's there's pretty convincing evidence, I think. I mean, particularly from Eastern Europe about what happens when um, when you restrict availability of alcohol or when alcohol becomes more expensive and it, of course it's controversial of course it's controversial you know we, we need to be mindful that we're we're adults in an adult society and we're, you know it's 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 great uh, and we have a certain amount of choice but you know there, there is a debate to be had about how how we how we um how we how we you know what how we meet that particular challenge because certainly alcohol um is um a problem in suicidal behavior it, it has a much a uh, wider um, health footprint, if you like. It, it doesn't just affect suicide; it affects lots of other things. Um, so, you know, we we have to, uh, as an individual society, decide what 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 we're going to do about that. Are we going to are we going to legislate? Are we going to um, are we going to uh, reduce availability in some other ways? So, we've had uh, we've had. In the UK, we've had uh, a certain amount of legislation north of the border, so in Scotland, and the English government have, have decided not to do that. You know, um, it, it's a tricky one. I mean, it, it, and, and in many ways, that from a public health perspective, it's a bit like you know the, the smoking. Uh, uh, what what what's happened to um, uh, smoking in public places and here plain packaging, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I think it's absolutely vital mm -hmm. aspect of suicide. This is quite an interesting uh, question from Shaya Mala. She is uh, she or he? I'm very sorry if I've got that wrong. Has asked um, what has been what is being done to address the staff attitudes to self harming in the UK. Yeah, it's a bit it's a big one, and you know we're not um, and and I must say there are. There are um, examples of excellent, excellent kind of care that people tell us about, um, but there are still unfortunately um, uh, problems in, in, you know, uh, sometimes when people uh, present to emergency uh, departments. And I think, uh, what, what's that about? Well, it, it's about staff being busy, so staff in emergency departments being busy. It's about a perception, I think, that sometimes people who have self-harmed have done it to themselves so they're they're kind of responsible 
Um, and that's one of the reasons we, we in the UK have dropped the deliberate from deliberate self-harm because, you know, service users and patients tell us, you know what, that's a bit pejorative, really. Um, you know, sometimes it, it it's not like we, we're, we're aiming to do this in order to manipulate you in some way. You know, if we wanted to seek attention, there are better ways to do it than to take tablets, to sit in an emergency room for four hours, to wait another two hours to see a psychiatrist. So um, I think, you know, the, the whole um, the whole notion that it that it's... Um, uh, deliberate needs to change um, and part of it is about staff training so if staff don't feel fully equipped if they're not trained properly uh, they're, they're going to struggle so part of it is understanding where service users come from it's not deliberate it's you know it's a potentially serious problem um, that, that may lead to death they need to take it seriously part of it's about equipping them um, to to deal with people who are suicidal we need to do much better than that and as many people are across the world doing excellent excellent work Ella Aronsman's done training I know Alice Cole King in the, in the UK and, and many many others apologies if I've not mentioned uh, mentioned mentioned everyone's work but it but it you know that that training can really make a difference uh, Nicole has asked um, having what well, has said having clinical guidelines is a positive way to move forward but what can be done should the targets for these guidelines not be met within health services uh, that's a that's a really interesting one so certainly if you like the the idea behind those quality standards I showed you so those eight markers of quality, quality services is that partly they'd be used by people who are buying services so basically they'd look to see well um, has, has the service that I'm going to commission for people who self harm in this general hospital, have they got a system where they can ensure most people are assessed or, or haven't they? Have they got a system where they can uh, look at psychological intervention? So partly it would be used even at the point of commissioning services. But you're right. I mean, part of those quality standards, are, I think the, the idea behind them is they would be used as a, as a means of kind of future funding. And um, I mean, this is this is a very, very tricky issue. But you could say, well, you know, we, we need to move to a system where, well, absolutely, we have to hold ourselves as, as people who work in health services to account. We have to make sure that we're providing um, care for our patients. Um, and part of it might mean that if we're not doing what we were, what we're being paid, what our service is being commissioned to do, you know, we need to think again. We either need to change our approach um, or even more controversially, the people buying the service need to change the provider. Now, uh, you know, I, I, I personally think, you know, I'm, I'm a, I work in a national health system. I like a centralised approach. I think it leads to economies of scale. But, you know, we, we need to be um, we need to be thinking about that. But it isn't just about the target. So it isn't, it isn't necessarily about, you know, the overall suicide rate in a, in a, a mental health service or the overall self-harm rate, which might be affected by all kinds of other things. It's a really important process measure. So, you know, what do patients and service users coming through your service think? Um, you know that that's going to be an important um, important process measure. But you're right; we need to evaluate what we do, and you know it's public money at the end of the day. We need to make sure that we spend it spend it wisely. I think we've got time for two more quick questions. Um, the first one is from Carolina. She would appreciate any comments on the relationship between suicidal behaviour and the internet. Yeah, um, it's 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 again a huge issue. We could fill an entire uh, uh, lecture on it. I think you know it's it's a uh, Certainly in the UK, it's a, an issue that's particularly pertinent to young people. I think, you know, one of the things I'd, I'd just, I I'd just want to say is that, um, yes, you know, a lot of the publicity is about the role of social media in propagating uh, suicidal behaviour, but, you know, there's an awful lot of helping stuff out there. So the opportunities in terms of intervention, the opportunities in terms of helping people are... Um, are, are immense. So I think we, we need to be exploiting that. Yes, um, yes. you know, uh, th there may be instances where, you know, um, it, it has effects, the internet, the, the web, social media has effects that we would not want. But, you know, uh, these things are now a fact of life. We can't, we, and we shouldn't, um, wind back the clock, clock uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, with the, you know, the, these are these are things that are, are in, in, our, in our lives and we need to think about how we best use them for uh, therapeutic benefit rather than you know um, uh, uh, to, to uses that aren't, um, aren't aren't helpful. Legislating the internet, we can't do that. We have to, I think, we have to think. Legislating is you know, maybe a, a small part of it, but but it but it's much wider than that. Given the given the worldwide kind of focus. This is our final question, and I'd just like to say thank you to everyone no, for being involved. Um, before we get to this one, this is the final one is from Jacinta, and I think it is a really interesting one to end on. She's asked if you can mention some practical or applied methods for engaging the lived experience of both suicidal persons and clinicians 
into a system-based research I, I, design? I, um, I, I think the first thing is is getting people kind of talking and getting people in the in the same room. So, if we, you know, basically, if, if you're talking about a systems approach or a, or a you know, I might uh, talk about a, a, an approach across the care pathway. So, you know, from primary care to to specialist services to inpatient care, you know, you have to have all the people kind of talking to each other. And uh, you know, I think I think certainly that's um, uh, that's improving. Uh, you know, we've got groups where uh, academics uh, are talking to clinicians and are talking to service users. I think you know, in the past, um, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we might have been, uh, you know, clinicians or, or researchers might have been a little wary of engaging with service users. But now, you know, it's so mainstream. It's so important to have um, the voice of service users and carers uh, on board um, and you know uh, part of that's a role of postvention so what what do you do after suicide death has occurred to um, prevent future distress prevent future suicidal behavior but a lot of it's about the population and um, uh, clinical interventions we've been talking about and and you know service users I think have a particular role in, in telling us what's effective what helps them um, why it helps them and then helping us to design services so you know one of the things we've talked about in the UK is if you're designing a service for people with um, suicidal behavior well you know they need to be an intrinsic part of that so I think both in research and practice it, it's, it's really important it will only help our interventions to be more effective Thank you. I think that's all we have time for. We've, we've been very lucky to have Professor Kapoor today. He has taken time out of his holiday. Wow. His family are at the zoo um, and he is going to join them. So we pre greatly appreciate his time. I'd just like to let everyone know on the line that this webinar will be available on the Black Dog Institute YouTube site probably later next week. Um, and that Professor Kapoor will also be presenting at the summit on Monday, which we're very grateful. So thank, thank you. you very much, Hi, everyone. everyone. Thanks, for, uh, thanks for attending.